Welcome and happy Sabbath, everyone. Very happy to see all of you again for the third night of our revival meeting. We shall now sing our first song, Hymn 216, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks to turn the bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over all the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, all we Amen. Let us all now sing our theme song, Knowing You, Jesus.
Amen. We shall now invite Brother Calvin to do the opening prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious and Father, Lord, indeed knowing you is what we want, Lord. You're all, you're the best. You're the joy and our righteousness, Lord. But at this moment, as we come to you um, to worship you as well as to listen to your message, Lord, I pray that you continue to be with us, continue to bless us with the Holy Spirit, that as uh, Pastor Wilson speaks, we'll be able to gain something from it as we have gained to be brave, brave and as well, as to, well to be obedient. We, continue, we pray that we continue to be to learn more about you and to be more like you. I pray that you please be with us this evening as we also go through the Sabbath. That as we go through this Sabbath, we'll be blessed, um, not just because of the Sabbath, but as well with this message to Lord. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, it is indeed a blessing to be part of this uh, revival meeting. I believe all of us have been blessed uh, by this sharing that we have been involved in. Okay. Uh, we shall now call Brother Jonathan Juliman to present us with a special number. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Jonathan, 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 for the, for the wonderful uh, song you have presented. Okay, our scripture reading is taken from the book of uh, Joshua, chapter 14, verse 13 to 15. I'll read. Joshua chapter 14, verse 13 to 15. 13. Then Joshua blessed Kelch, son of Jerephune, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. 14. So Hebron was belonged to Caleb, son of Jephune, the Canaanite, ever, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. 15. Hebron used to be called Kiryat Arba after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. The land had rest from war. We shall now pass the time to Pastor Wilson, who will be presenting us uh, today's message, the continuation of the past three days. Uh, the time is yours, Pastor. Thank you, uh, Elder Peter. I'd like to greet all of you, blessed and happy Sabbath. So blessed that we have now come to this moment to study more, to know more about Jesus. And day one, we were reminded to have uh, courage, to have boldness like Abraham. Even though he has to face, he had a great trial, greater trial, I would say, because when he was faced with Isaac, he knew, he believed in the promise of resurrection. But when he saw the death of Sarah, it really happened. Death really happened. And he already believed in the resurrection. And then yesterday we talked about his son, Isaac. Both of them were very successful. Both of them had beautiful wife. Both of them were very rich. But yet God blessed Isaac in a very different way. God always used perhaps similar pattern, similar ways of doing things. And yet... He does it always differently with everyone. We all have our own path. And as long as we have the obedient heart, the compliance attitude, like Isaac, or perhaps I would mention also Barak, then we would be able to carry on. And tonight, I'd like to bring your attention to the man called Caleb. And as Elder Peter has read it, now we realize Kiryat Arba. Kiryat Arba was mentioned again. And this time, this, this place is associated with a man called Caleb. And we know that Caleb was mentioned not simply because he was just another fulfillment, not just because, you know, the, the Israelites were entering the land of Canaan, but this time we will see how God is working even in an old man like Caleb. Because I believe sometimes in this kind of a revival, we all reflect on our own. And some of us who are younger, some of us who are older, we might be thinking, Pastor, what role am I playing in? What kind of contribution I can do for my church? And I know we all love our church. But sometimes there are people who, who are on the front seat. There's people who are on the back seat. But I believe we all do play our part equally and yet differently. And through these nights of revival, I just want to pray that the Holy Spirit will empower us, will impress you about your calling. Because like yesterday I was saying, it wasn't a story of success. It wasn't a story of motivation. It was more like a story of calling. And I hope you will find your calling. And if you do have found your calling, I hope you will find greater ground, greater influence. And if you've been maturing in your Christianity, if you've been multiplying your resources, your influence, you've been expanding 
the kingdom of God in many different ways, I pray that you will keep on going. You will keep on going and continue to work. Church family, I stumbled upon a quote these few weeks. I mean, it always rang in my mind these few weeks. And I got this quote, not from an SDE uh, writer, but it is, oh, he's a non-SDE writer and he said something like this. And you want to know this. He said, the world that we're living right now will go on like normal until Jesus comes. The world that we are living right now with the work, routines, with all our family business, with our daily affairs, it will go on and stay normal like as this until the day of Jesus comes. It will the time of Noah. Remember the time of Sodom and Gomorrah? Days, the, the daily routine were like normal, not until they face the judgment day. Church, I don't want us to fall into sleep or into hibernate mode. I know we're enjoying our, you know, our career. I understand we have priorities. And Pastor Noah, uh, two days ago, we had a young adult pastor's meeting here in uh, Southern California. And uh, as I was reflecting on my testimony, I, I thought of, you know, I, I do have a lot of struggles with the most missing age in the church, age 20 to 40. And as I thought to myself, I was listening to others. And you know what? The other people, our, our other, other Adventist churches are also experiencing the same thing. And if you are age 20 to 40, I'm telling you, you are the most blessed. And we, this church must be the most blessed if you have that, that group of people in your church. Because that's, that's the most missing age in, uh, in our church nowadays. I don't know, again, with, with your, uh, in your place in uh, KL right now. But over here, the moment people go to, uh, the moment people get married, they're already lost. The moment they have a kid, they're already missing. And it seems like there's a time limit for spirituality. And I, you know, I, I do get it. We all learn, learn from our school where we learn about priorities, where we, where we learn to set our goals, objectives. And we somehow put our spirituality one of our priorities. And I think I, I'd like to remind us that spirituality is not our priorities. It shouldn't be in the list because spirituality is who we are. And, you know, I don't want you to be led to think that there is a distinction between spirituality and your daily life. There shouldn't be. There shouldn't be. I used to think that there's a difference between spiritual, spiritual life and my physical life. I believe in my physical life, in my exercise, when I go out to gym, when I do my fitness, I could still be, I could still overpray my heart. Amen. I believe when I do my social life, when I mingle with my friends, with everyone, I believe I could still exercise my spiritual life. So that that coming together and pulling together every part of our life, it become we become whole. We become the version that God wants us to be. So I hope again this week of revival, this nights of revival, will remind us to be whole again in Jesus Christ. So tonight, uh, let's again take on our Bible. Again, I try to make it easier and uh, you know easier for us to remember. I know we often forget, and so I always encourage you to use notebooks, use uh, your Bibles, use your phones, use your apps, use your whatever means or devices, ways that can help us re remind ourselves again about God's promises. Now, let's go into Joshua chapter 14. Let's go now into Joshua chapter 14. I hope, you know, 
this week, this night of prayer will not just be another night of prayer. It might look like just another night of prayer, but I believe by God's grace that he will lead us into a closer walk with him. Are you there with me? Joshua chapter 14. Let me share you my screen as you open your Bible in Joshua chapter 14. We have take on Genesis chapter 23. Then we learn Genesis 26. Now we're moving on to Joshua 14. You know, uh, in our church, we sent out Bible reading, a Bible chapter. And if you have not, you know, personally done it, I'd like to encourage you to read your Bible a chapter a day. I guess uh, maybe I'm a bit picky when it comes to Bible reading. I understand some people that in a year they could achieve the whole Bible, but I guess this is not a race. <laughs> Reading the Bible is not a race. I would love to take one Bible chapter a day. So that's why, you know, and this, this, this is the same way I present uh, my my sermon. So it's easy for people to, to you know, uh, bring everything together in just one chapter. Now, a man named Caleb. Let's begin with reading verse 6 and 7. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh, Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh, Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Church, the book of Joshua was... Uh, a powerful book. It's a powerful book. I hope one of these days our Sabbath school will come back again to the book of Joshua and we will learn the length, the depth, just the beautiful messages and insights from the book of Joshua. But if you have already read the book of Joshua, you would find the book of Joshua would be a little bit similar or you know, comparable to books like uh, Numbers, books of Ezekiel. I mean, it belongs, this book belongs to the books that perhaps you don't really understand. Because if you if you try to glance a little bit, let's go, you know, try to glance a little bit to other chapters in the book of Joshua, you would find the book of, the book of Joshua is more like a settlement book. Because if you see the previous chapter, all right, this is talking about how Joshua finally landed on the promised land and they began to settle their business. They began to defeat all the kings. And before, uh, before they will divide the lands, before they will divide the inheritance, this comes, this, this story comes, the story about Caleb. You see, if you go to the top, I don't know with your Bible, but with my Bible, Joshua 14, it has a heading or a title, The Land Divided West of the Jordan. Is that, is that, is that what you are? Is it the same thing with your Bible? It's the division on the west of the Jordan. So my Bible is telling that the, there was, uh, this is the beginning of the division of the land. And it's amazingly beautiful how the story began with an old man called Caleb who has a determination. Uh, I would say, a, you know, a, a very powerful determination who's been waiting for 40 years. I know, I know, 40 years is, uh, you know, is very identical with Moses, right? If we think about 40 years, 
we think about Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, you know, with the Israelites. But I also want you to think that 40 years were not only spent by Moses and the Israelites, but it was also spent specifically by Caleb. And while Joshua seemingly like taking the whole spotlight on him, because Joshua was the apprentice, was the servant, was the successor of Moses. And so when Moses uh, Moses died, Joshua took over. And you can see Joshua was one of the most, you know, he has one of the most successful and smooth leadership in his time. And Joshua is one of the antitype of Christ. We all love the character of Joshua. You know, and I hope one day I will preach also about Joshua. But regard. Um, um, what I'm trying to say is that Caleb was like a man, his story was like a story in the background. None was, none was, I mean, not much was covered, was told about Caleb before the chapter. Here, the old man came after 40 years. And right now, he came to he came to a uh, he came to his brother. They were among the spies. You know, this is like an old reunion where they used to together. And remember, them were the the best of their own. You know, the twelve spies were not just ordinary guys. They were like navy seals. Okay, they were like you know they are very highly respected. You know, and they have highly classified mission to go on to Jericho and spy. And here he was, came into jo to Joshua and trying to remind Joshua, look, Joshua, I have not changed. I knew God's promise very well. And I hope you remember what Moses said before we land or arrive here in the promised land. And let's go down to verse 8 and 9. Nevertheless, my brethren, okay, maybe let me just read verse 7 for the sake of, uh, you know, maybe I will, I miss that. But do I miss that, verse 7? Okay, no, I don't miss that. Verse 8, nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. He retell again the story of that when they were out together as spies. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. Yesterday, if you see Isaac, there's this phrase, the Lord blessed him. The Lord was with him, right? And it, it did not only come from him, it also finally came out of the mouth of Abimelech, the man who made trouble with him. So Isaac was known for that description. Now I want you to see a man like Caleb has this self-proclaimed description. And I don't want to say it's a pride. It is not a pride. But he was so determined. And he said, I follow God with all my heart. How many of us here tonight who can say to our hearts, Pastor, I have followed God with all my heart. And he says, I wholly follow the Lord my God. Remember that phrase. So Moses Soar on that day, saying, Surely the land where your food has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have fully found just Caleb. Remember, Moses credited this to Caleb because you have followed the Lord my God. I mean, just to think again and reflect on this phrase. C.S. Lewis said, a half religion is no religion at all. How many times, you know, I would break the heart of God, I would miss on what on God's will, or I ignoredly do things on my way and I overlook the good thing I'm supposed to do. As a, even as a pastor, sometimes I would go on with my duties, 
with my responsibilities and yet mindlessly, you know, without thinking it so hard or reflecting on it. I did it out of my routine. I did it out of my, my you know, out of my, me being responsible of what I'm being assigned for. But I realized, you know, our life doesn't have to go down into that path. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to be, we don't have, we, 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 sh we, should, we should know better. We should understand deeper that, you know, our relationship is, is more than just what we're doing. Our relationship is our being, right? Our relationship is the total sum of who we are. Our relationship is every part of our life. Amen. So again, Moses said, you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Verse 10, 11. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said, this 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Let me stop right here. I don't know if there is any of you who's been waiting and working for an answer to your prayer. I don't know how many years, how much moments, how many times, how much times you have spent to wait for an answer. I don't know. Perhaps you're going through something that you've been, you've been trying your best, you've been attempting your very best to make it happen, and it's still not yet happening. And here we see an old man for 45 years, for 45 years, he remembered it clearly in his mind. Moses said, whatever my feet tread, Wherever my feet goes, that will be my inheritance. And you know what? You will see later on, that's how they divided the land. They did not divide the land by how big is your tribe. They did not divide the land by how powerful is your tribe. They divide the land by how far you go. So I believe, you know, uh, Elder Daniel, I don't believe that God has... You know, I don't personally. I don't believe that God has already predestined or set. Okay, let's say Elder Daniel has uh, five talents. Elder Peter has three talents. Uh, Kelvin has one talent. I, I, I personally, I don't believe so. There is no predestination. I don't believe it has been uh, predetermined. I believe whatever we have, it depends on how far we want to go with God. If we say, Pastor. Look at look at me. I'm already old. I'm done. That that's where that's 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 the last step you you will take. But even if tonight you say, Pastor, I'm going to a higher ground. Pastor, I want to wait for God's promise. Pastor, I know I'm getting old, but I will never stop. Pastor, I know uh, the boat is sinking. Everything else is 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 not going well, but I will keep going. So I don't believe that your life has been written. So I pray that you will. You will, you know, you will learn from this guy, man called Caleb. So, oh, I haven't I finished the story. The, I mean, the sentence. Let me continue. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as on. Let me read that one again. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Wow, wow. He said, Moses, I mean Joshua, the same man, the same unchanged man, the same unmoved man. I'm still immovable. I'm still as strong as I was. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war. Wow, wow. He said he wants to go for war. And, you know, perhaps some people might say, oh man, this guy is just big mouth. You know, we always have the, those kind of guys, right? Maybe he's just like Peter. He's just big mouthing. But he was not big mouthing. 
and this is this is not something of his habit this is truly his faith speaking boldly courageously obediently and now with much persistence he said we are i am ready for going out and for coming i'm ready for war 85 years old so remember Caleb did not say where is my where's my inheritance pastor where's my inheritance where, come on give me give me give me give me what i deserve no he said give me i will ready for my war i'm ready for whatever's coming if you want to set me for another war, look, Joshua, I'm done for it. 85 years old, been waiting for 45 years. Now, let's talk about who's Caleb. Caleb, if you, if, as you read it, Caleb was born in Egypt because he said he spent 45 years, remember, waiting in the wilderness. So, before wilderness, meaning he was 40 years old. And then he spent 45 years old. Are you with me? And so he's now 85 years old. So he was born in Egypt. He was born in slavery. He was born in the worst possible time along with the Israelites. Remember, Israelites was born in, in slavery. So they were not trained for war. But Imagine over the years, God equipped them, God blessed them, and now they became so highly trained, all right? And so high, so blessed because of God. And think, think about his life sketch. Caleb spent her, his first 40 years of his life as a slave and probably helping construct Egypt's great building projects of that era. And his name, Caleb's name means dog. And I don't know if any of you have dogs. I know Malaysia is like Indonesia, you know, maybe, you know, dogs is not the most popular, the most popular um, animal or pets. But right here in America, man, dogs are like children. Dogs are like a family here, you know. Dogs has a place in the car. Dog has a seat in the in the bedroom. Dog has a seat anywhere, everywhere, even in a restaurant. You you will not be forbidden to bring your dogs. You know, maybe some will be forbidden, but very friendly here. You know, when they think of dogs, some people would give their dogs with human name. Am I right? You know, sometimes I'm like, why why do you give your dog's name with someone's name? Like you know, and I don't want to mention you. Okay. I feel bad if I mention you, but here, Caleb means dog. What I'm saying is that Caleb's name is a dog. His name means dog. And, uh, you know, when we say dogs, when we say dogs in the Bible times, we're not, we're not trying to uh, insult the person. Dogs simply means that, you know, they were treated badly. I, I believe the father gave the name dogs to you know to to show how desperate, how terrible, how awful their life was. And so that's Caleb was. He spent 40 years as a slave, like a dog. And that's why his name was Dog. But I want you to know also that dogs in Bible times were mainly were mainly uh, they they mainly used as companies as companion to the shepherd as shepherd uh, the sheep not only the, he brings uh, a rod and a staff but he also usually comes with dogs so dogs were protector dogs were like companion so dogs, since the old time, has been a man's companion, but in a different way. So uh, they, they use dogs for, for work, all right? But these days, people use dogs for, you know, just for their family life. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it was. You know, dogs. Dogs were used for companion, human companion for work. So 
my question is, well, how, 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 George, how do you think Caleb has the same, has a very powerful motivation when he was treated the same thing as others? Caleb was not the only one who was treated like a dog. He was among with others. And um, Alan White says there were like almost 2 million who went out of Egypt, who traveled, imagine almost 2 million and traveled down to Canaan. And he was just like everybody else. Everybody was treated harshly. But what kind of determination that he has? What kind of faith? And, you know, he, he was, we know it, he was one of the two with Joshua who believed the promise of God. He believed it before he, he set his foot in the promised land. And, you know, when Caleb reached 40 years of age, God powerfully, miraculously freed Israel. And you know it. And, you know, Joshua and Caleb, two of them become the minority. They become the minority, you know, among everyone who did not believe truly on what they were about to receive, the promised land. So here we know, you know, we know the words of Caleb in Numbers 13, and his words still ring. In the in the you know in the hearts of Joshua, both of them knew this when he said, "Yes, the people are big, but the God of Israel, the God of creation, is far more powerful." Amen. He saw the people of the land, Arba. Arba is one of the big people in the land. In fact, you will find in the last verse of the chapter. It's specifically mentioned, Kiryat Arba. The name Kiryat Arba, it, it comes from the word, I mean, one of the names, one of the two names, two words, Arba is a great hero of the descendants of Anna. It means that, you know, um, they were the, the people of that land really known for their, their um, skills or their capability. And here, Caleb did not find himself going backward. He found himself always as strong as he was. He was not different. He also saw the same thing like others. And yet he has the same faith. But it wasn't until he was 85 years old that he finally saw God's promise fulfilled. Wow, wow. Um, Elder Peter, I met my mom after 15 years. The last time I, I um, before I got here to America, my mom is here in America. I was in anywhere in Southeast Asia. The last time I met her was 2001. And then she left Indonesia. And you know, there are some issues. And so um, I finally was able to come here to America for the first time in 2016. And you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a long years, 15 years that I met my mom. And you know, when we met, <laughs> they asked my mom and they asked me, so Pastor Wilson, how did it feel? And he, they asked my mom, so uh, auntie, how does it feel now that you meet your son? They asked me, how is, does it feel now that you meet your mother? And surprisingly, both of, both of us have the same answer. We said, church, we felt so sad until we have no more tears to cry. You know, we felt so sad that, you know, it felt numb because it's been 15 years. Now, I couldn't imagine someone like Caleb must have waited, see all the drama, Worse than Korean drama, worse than uh, you know, Squid Game or whatever. You they are seeing forty years with the land, the people of the land, people of Israel keep complaining every day, all right. And now he has arrived in the promised land. He's still as strong as he was. He's still as determined as he was. But it was not until eighty-five years old. He's been waiting, 
and but now the time has come for him to possess and to have that promise. He was in the past for season in his life. After 45 years, he was still going strong and won great for God's glory. And this prayer tonight that pastor, I still want to accomplish great things for my church. Pastor, I still want to accomplish great things for my faith. Pastor, whatever season I'm going through, whether I'm single, whether I'm married, whether I have a kid, whether I'm still waiting for my jobs promotion, whether I'm still stuck with this situation, Pastor, I pray for one thing above everything. I pray for God's glory. Amen. So this is not prosperity theology. I'm telling you something even better than prosperity theology. This is about asking for God's glory, to be basked, to, to put ourselves wholly in God's glory like Caleb was. Wow. This verse is very powerful. He said, as yet I am as strong this day, or the day that Moses sent me. The same strength was then, and now is his strength for war. He was the same. <clears throat> Caleb was the same like others. He was treated the same way. He saw the same way, and he also waited like others. Am I right? The whole, the whole new generation who arrived in Canaan was not the same guy who were back in Egypt. The whole generation who came out of Egypt has already died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And I feel like our journey here on earth is the same like Israel, church family. I pray the same generation right now who's, who's watching this, who's listening to this, who's attending this meeting will be in heaven. Amen. I don't want and I pray like Moses prayed. And I believe Pastor Noah prayed the same way. I pray that not God will not blot out one of our names here and we will all be there in heaven. But look, church family, we all have to wait. We all have to persevere. We all have to face oppositions and trials like Abraham, like Isaac, and all like Cain, like, like Caleb. He must <clears throat> saw his own people. And you must be thinking like, Pastor, it's the same story like my story. It seems like there's nothing good coming out of my life story right now. If I have to die tomorrow, Pastor, I don't know what good can they remember from me. Church, I want you to know the story of Caleb might look like a story of disappointment. The story of your life might look like a, a dream different story. But I want you to see how the old man, a powerful example for perseverance and faith and finishing strong. Anybody can start the journey. Anybody can continue to keep up. But what only counts is those who finish strong. Amen? What only counts in the race is who finished strong. Oh yeah, I passed. I have the experience. I got it. You it have all the salt. You've been trained. You've been, you know, you are a seasoned Christian. You're a seasoned Adventist church member. But it doesn't matter. Regardless of who you are, only those who will finish strong will make it. How do I know? Matthew 24 said, those who will remain until the end will be in heaven. Verse 14, when the gospel proclamation has been told, those who remain until the end, those who finish strong. So remind us again of the experience of Caleb. They were faced with giants. The people of Israel had the mentality of grasshopper. They have this grasshopper syndrome, they call it. Grasshopper syndrome, meaning that we believe that only big people, only great people can succeed. Only big people, big names who can be a great example. That's grasshopper syndrome. 
and I hope none of us here has a grasshopper syndrome. None of us here is led to think that, oh, Pastor, only the elders will make it, or only the deacons, or only those who are ordained, only those who are active at church, only those who are, you know, uh, actively preaching or serving. Forget the grasshopper syndromes. Keep facing those giants in your life, and don't forget God. Always be with Him in every part of the story of your life. And so as we close this, let's read this text, verse 12 and 13. This is his request. Now, Joshua, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. Church, pray for that. Give me this mountain. Caleb was not just buffling. Caleb was not just, you know, speaking little thing here. He said, give me the mountain. I'm ready. He was not just begging. Please give me, please give me. He meant what he said. Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there. There was the race. And that the cities were great and fortified. He was talking about the structure. It may be that the Lord will and I will drive them out as the Lord said. Wow. It made me feel goosebumps. The old man says, it may be that the Lord will be with me. That's his only mantra. That's his only chanting. That's his only word that he kept in his mind. He meditated over and over again that the Lord will be with me. It may be the Lord with me. And I shall be able to do it as the Lord said. You see that there is this courage. There's this boldness. There's also obedience. And he did it with perseverance. And what happened? And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Church, let me close it this way. Abraham wanted the land wanted the cave, in fact, only as a gesture of his respect for his beloved wife. He turned out to be that purchase to become the first piece of the fulfillment of God's promise. It turned out to be your life's problem driving you, helping you thrive in a way that you couldn't possibly imagine. And that's why the Bible says God is always blessing us more than we could imagine. Because the very problem that we always desperate for, the very problem that we always complain for, God can use them to drive us even closer to him. And now Joshua, I mean Caleb, and now Caleb, fast forward thousand years. I mean, not until thousand years, I guess. Hundred years. Fast forward hundred years. Caleb become the first person who began the division of the land as they settled down in Canaan. And the first man who claimed the land is not coincidence, the same man claimed Hebron. Because that Hebron was called Kiryat Arba. Kiryat Arba was, was, was the people of giants. This time it was different. But then somehow God let the first people before eventually verse chapter 15 and onwards, you will find Israel will divide the land. But the first man has the same faith like Abraham was. Amazing. I believe fast forward to our time, fast forward to this time, thousand years later, in a hope Adventist church, God would see Caleb's in this church. Amen. God would see different Caleb's in our hearts. The spirit is still the same. The spirit who moved Abraham 
Isaac and Caleb to move all the mountains in their life is the same spirit that we will see today. I believe I will witness today. God will work, work and move the mountains of our life today. He will revive us. He will make us born again. And it will be a total makeover. And God will be praised a bit in the midst of us. Church family, this is an extra. You know, like you know, when you watch a movie, right? There's an extra, right? So let me give you an extra here. What's the book that comes after Joshua? Judges. Judges. Thank you. <laughs> Do you know the first, the first judge in Israel? What's his name? Letter O. What's his name? Othniel, right? Do you know the wife of Othniel was the daughter of Caleb? And you know what? Caleb's daughter and Othniel <clears throat> were the only righteous judge. Because after them, the book of judge is the book of judges is the worst book in terms of morality compared to other books. The worst time ever period in Israel's time. But before that, there was a righteous man named Othniel. And this Othniel, if you see the story, you will look into the book of Judges, you will find Othniel was influenced strongly also by his wife. His wife had the same faith like his father was, Caleb. My point is that, church, if you have the same faith like Caleb, I believe God will not only bless Hope Aaron's church, he will bless your next generations to come. God bless all of us. Happy Sabbath. Uh, thank you, Pastor Wilson, for the wonderful message. Uh, for our closing song, let us sing our theme song again, Knowing You, Jesus.
Let us pray. Yes, Lord, we love you. We truly love you. And we want to follow you with all our hearts, just like Caleb was. Lord, we learn from the life of Caleb. Though his life was like a life of a dog, though his life was treated harshly like a dog, though he feels like he has to wait for years, though he saw the same thing, he saw and treated and waited like others did. And yet, he came out just as strong as he was. He came out, I believe, even greater in his faith, ready to take on the mountains, ready for war, ready to receive the inheritance. The same way, Lord, we do here, as we are being revived by your spirit, as we are being born again in your promise, in your words alone, I pray to God, even if we see our life treated like dogs, even if sometimes we become lowered, we become discouraged, we become disappointed, we feel like that life is just continue to sink, we will keep on singing. We will keep on praising. We will keep on lifting our heart, our hands eye on you, trusting that you will deliver, trusting that you will bless us even further. So once again, God, I pray that you will bestow, grant your blessings on Hope and Research family and everyone who's here tonight, that you will not only bless these wonderful men and women and children and parents and everyone who's in here, like Caleb was, but you will also bless them in the generations to come. And by your leadership, by your guidance, by your providence, you will lead them all the way, every day, closer to you, closer to each other, closer to the community around and to your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.